thank you for coming to Beyond the Crypt, Practical iOS Reverse Engineering. Are there any reverse engineers in the room? Cool. Any asp aspiring reverse engineering in the room? All right, cool. Okay, so it's Beyond the Crypt, Practical iOS Reverse Engineering. My name is Michael Allen, and I'm a security consultant with IOActive. So why this talk? Well, it's kind of based on my own personal experience as when I started out testing mobile applications, I primarily focused on just running the common tools and performing the common tests. And I didn't pay much attention to what was happening under the hood. And that approach worked for a while, but then with what I found out happening was the common issues would get closed. And that was due to improvements in iOS and so on. And so at that point, I had to change my approach. And this talk is based on discussing that change process. Additionally, you might be at the point where you want to move away from testing third-party iOS applications and get more into iOS itself. And so this talk is again aimed at at least getting you started. So the approach that we will take is we'll first of all look at the common toolkit, the general toolkit. We'll then look at the tests that you would perform using those tools, the results that they produce, and the issues that you will run into. And then when we, we, we get into those issues, we'll see how we can move beyond those issues or work around those issues. And that's the, the main point of the talk. So let's get started. So the first thing, of course, is the, what's the general toolkit and what does that look like? The general toolkit in, includes a jailbroken device, tools for manipulating the file system, for tools for intercepting network traffic, instrumentation, and so on. So, of course, you will need a jailbroken device, goes without saying, and for those who might not be familiar with the process of jailbreaking, it simply removes the software restrictions that have been imposed by iOS through a series of software exploits. I would recommend that you have a dedicated device for testing, given that you are, in fact, weakening the security posture of the device. The latest public jailbreak right now is Pangu for iOS 9.2 to 9.3.3, supported on 64-bit architectures. There are private jailbreaks for iOS 10, but these are the publicly available options. Just some housekeeping. Well, the different types of jailbreaks. So there is the tethered jailbreak, which requires a computer to start a device. Untethered, of course, does not. And then semi-tethered is a mixture of both. So the latest Pangu jailbreak is kind of semi-untethered because once you reboot the device, you have to, again, run the app to re-jailbreak the device. And just some housekeeping tips. Change the default root password from Alpine. I'd also encourage you to access the device over USB, for example, using USB MOXD. So you would simply run the command instructions here using TCP relay, listen on port 22, and then forward that traffic over to the device. I'd also encourage you to use SSH keys. So you would generate your SSH key pair, and then you would copy the public key over to the device. And then finally, create a, an alias for the device so that you can simply just SSH into the name of the device. This, this approach beats having to type in the password every single time you connect the device and contending with IP addresses and so on. So moving files, you are going to have to move files between your local device and the, well, between your host machine and your testing device. And the tools of the trade are iPhone box, iX, iExplorer, and so on. But the truth is, you already have access to the device over SSH. So you can simply just use SFTP. And then you are also going to need to be able to intercept and make modifications to network traffic because most applications these days communicate with a backend web, well, with a backend server over HTTP or HTTPS. 
And so you're going to need a tool to be able to intercept and make modifications to that traffic. And the de facto tool here is Burp Suite Pro. There are other options, for example, Zap, the Z attack proxy. But when it comes to this domain, Burp Suite rules. So the simple configuration is on your host machine, you would configure Burp to listen on the particular IP and port. And then on your mobile device, you would point your mobile device to the machine that's running Burp. The issue that you will run into, however, is certificate pinning. And certificate pinning is simply that the application includes the certificate in the binary itself. And so to get around this, you would use SSL kill switch. However, SSL kill switch is kind of no longer maintained. So you now have SSL kill switch 2. And it's just a tweak that you would install on your device. And it's simple. You to disable and enable, it's just to toggle that button there. But keep in mind that once enabled, you are in fact disabling SSL certification, uh, certificate validation across the entire device. And so it's for this reason, again, why the recommendation is to use a dedicated testing device. And then there is instrumentation. And the tool of choice here, or the tool that you would usually see being recommended, is script. Now, script, it injects into a target process. Then it drops you into an interactive console. And the syntax is a mixture of Objective-C and JavaScript. It's just supported on a iOS and OS X. And then just recently, now Secure, which, which are the guys behind Frida, replaced the runtime engine by Frida. So, so it gives you the power of the power of Frida as well as the power of script. So in terms of script, you have the interactive console, so you get the JavaScript and Objective-C syntax. And then with Frida, you get a whole bunch of things. Combining the two, pretty powerful. And of course, the talk is entitled Beyond the Crypt. And it's actually a play on script. Now, there's nothing wrong with script. I'm not bashing script. But it's if you want to move beyond this point. So how do you use this tool? You simply specify the process ID that you are interested in instrumenting. And then you would simply issue the script command, script minus p, followed by the process ID. And that would drop you into the interactive console and the session would begin. And then there's Frida. Frida is the new kid on the block. It injects Google's V8 engine into the target process. And so it allows the JavaScript to be executed with full access to memory. You can perform function hooking. You have access to native methods. More importantly, you can inject into a starting process. And it's also supported on a number of architectures. Windows, Mac, Linux, and so on. This thing is pretty powerful. It, a lot of tools are now being built on top of Frida, are now powered by Frida. This thing brings instrumentation on steroids, crack cocaine, you name it. This is, this is pretty powerful stuff. So a quick example is to use Frida Trace. And we are accessing the device over USB, so hence the minus U option. And then we are looking for each time methods that start with receive are invoked. And this just prints it out, logs it to the screen. But again, this is just a, this example doesn't even begin to do justice to the Frida tool. It's pretty powerful. This is just brick, not even getting too deep. All right, and then there are common tasks. During an assessment, you are going to have to perform some common tasks. And there are a number of tools at your disposal. So there's IDB tool, there's Snoopit. Unfortunately, Snoopit is no longer maintained, at least not on 64-bit devices. There's IREC, there's Intraspy, and then there are some new players in the space. So there is Atmon and Needle, which were recently released at the Black Hat Arsenal earlier this year. So using the automated tools, for example, IDB tool, you can you know, look at the URL handler, dump the keychain, examine the pasteboard, look at logging, and so on. And an example of running that tool is shown here. Pretty simple. And then most of what you will be doing will be done from the 
command line interface. And so you're going to need command line interface tools. And the recommendation here is to use you know, Big Boss recommended tools or Erica utilities. And I'd also like to add the iOS bin pack. And the iOS bin pack is just a number of tools that have been compiled for the iOS platform by Jonathan Levin. And a snippet of the available tools are shown here. I would encourage you though that instead of, so it comes in a, in a tar file that you simply untar and then copy it over to the device. I have had issues, I have lost a jailbreak because of this, because some of these binaries didn't play well with some tweaks that I had installed. So I would recommend that rather, rather than just applying the entire tool or just unzipping the entire package, to select the binaries that you are interested in, at least to get started. But he has installed it on multiple devices, no issues. So it would seem that the issue would have been with my environment. All right, so that's the general toolkit that you would often see being recommended. And with that toolkit, the usual tests that we perform are usually along the lines of, well, let's go back, let's step back a bit. So we mentioned that applications communicate to a backend server using over HTTP or HTTPS, right? And we would usually use Burp Suite to intercept that traffic. Well, you can also create a remote virtual interface using RVI CTL. So what you would do is you would plug your device into iTunes. You would then note the UDID. And then you would simply issue RVI CTL minus S, specify the UDID. That brings up a virtual interface which you can then use the TCP dump tool to sniff the traffic passing through that interface. You can then dump that traffic to a PCAP file and then, for example, use Wireshark to, to process it. And that, is, that works on both jailbroken and non-jailbroken devices. All right, now most of the tests or attacks that you will perform are going to be related to insecure storage, right? So is sensitive information being stored in plist files, SQLite databases, and so on? So oh, what does this look like? plist files or property list files just stores serialized objects in key value pairs, and it might also be in binary format. And if it is, then you can simply convert it using the plutil tool. And in this example, we see the an, uh, an example of what not to do. So the application is actually storing the user's access pin in plain text, and it's pretty easy to retrieve. So this is a common test. Another test is client-side data stores. And you'd often see SQLite being used for client-side storage. It's just a lightweight database, and you query it using SQL. And again, in this example, you see the application storing sensitive information in the tables, and it's pretty easy to retrieve. Just a fun note on SQLite data stores, that deleting the data doesn't actually do what you think it does. In, instead, the deleted data is, get, is added to a free list, and the free records are not overwritten until more space is required. This, the, the end result of this, then, is that deleted data might exist for a while. And there are, in fact, tools that allow you to retrieve this data. So just a, just a side note. And then there is the keychain. Under the hood, the keychain is just a SQLite database. And its location is in var keychains. Can store sensitive information again. And usually, you would dump the entire contents of the keychain using keychain dumper. And then there are snapshots. Once an iOS application goes into the background, it takes a snapshot. And the location of that snapshot is pretty much known. And so if that image contained sensitive in information, then we have some information disclosure. And then there's the cache. The cache is, it operates similar to your web browser's cache. And it's just aimed at improving performance. And again, it may store sensitive information. You can interact with the cache using your common SQLite tools. And of course, you would get the SQLite tools from the command line utilities that we mentioned earlier on. And then there are binary cookies. The assumption being 
that if it's in binary format, then you can store anything in it because you won't be able to access it. It's a wrong assumption, right? Because there are tools that allow you to, to retrieve that information. And then there's IPC. So apps will register URL schemes, and you can then invoke the application through its URL scheme. Now, there was an issue with Skype back in the day where a malicious application could invoke Skype to make premium calls without the user's consent. This was the attack vector that they used. This attack vector has now no, has no been, well, let's go back one step. Okay, so to determine the URL scheme, you would either consult the plist file or you would dump the binary and then run strings on the binary and do a grep for the URL scheme. I would recommend using the LSD trip tool and the public URLs and private URLs option to get that information. All right, so just a note on IPC. So as I said, there was an issue with Skype. Well, with, the, with iOS 9, that attack vector has now been closed because iOS 9 has now introduced universal links. And with universal links, it is the developer who now specifies what URLs will be processed by the app. Communication is done over HTTPS. And in addition to this, prior to iOS 9, you could use the can open URL method to enumerate a list of installed applications on the device. iOS 9 also addressed this. So this is just another example of the common issues being closed. And then there are other attacks like injection attacks into UI web views and so on, and XML attacks and so on, right? The point here, though, is that most of the issues that you will find are going to relate to local storage. And one important fact to keep in mind is that for issues relating to local storage, it requires the device to be unlocked. Additionally, you could also find issues that relate to unsecured APIs, and you would discover that using Burp Suite Pro, for example. You might also discover some hard-coded secrets, but the fact is that most of the common issues that we have come to know and love are now being closed. For example, date binary protections are almost standard for most applications coming out of the App Store. There have been improvements in the data protection APIs, and as we just mentioned, universal links introduced in iOS 9 and so on. Additionally, some of the tools that we have come to know and love are either no longer supported or don't operate as we would expect. So, for example, Snoopit is not supported on 64-bit architectures. GDB is not supported on 64-bit again. Well, at least at the time of putting this presentation together. Class dump doesn't play well with certain binaries. And when we have issues with our tools, we go to Google. What if your Google foo fails you? Then at that point, you might need to extend the tool yourself. Or it could be that you are looking at an application that has implemented custom jailbreak detection routines. With increasing regularity, more and more applications are implementing jailbreak detection routines or custom security protections. And then, as we said, you might just simply want to move away from third-party assessments. When you get to this point, you're going to need to change your approach. And this is the, the heart of the talk. What is this new approach? This approach is going to involve reverse engineering, and it's going to leverage iOS internals, some ARM assembly, and a deeper dive into Objective-C and Swift. So first thing we have to do is, of course, improve our toolkit. And then once we have these new tools, we need to now look at how to expand our knowledge base. So what are these tools? Primarily, we are after disassembler. So there's IDA Pro. IDA Pro is to reverse engineering what Burp Suite Pro is to web app testing. It is the de facto tool, right? However, if you are buying this tool as a as an individual, you're going to need to sell at least two body parts. So you might need to lose a kidney or something. It's, it's pretty expensive, but it is feature rich, supported on a, it supports multiple architectures and so on. Just as a minor caveat, ID Pro Advanced is the one that costs a lot. Okay. That's the only one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So 
for those who did not hear, Ida Pro Advanced is the one that will cost an arm and a leg, right? Okay, so a couple thousand bucks. A couple thousand bucks. Yeah, it's 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 pretty expensive, but it is the de facto tool. But there are options, and so there is, for example, well, not that. Right, so there is Ida Pro, and then there are, so there are options, cheaper options, Hopper. Hopper just costs, costs like a couple hundred bucks. It's not as feature rich as Ida Pro, but it is enough to at least get you started. And then there is LLDB. LLDB is the replacement for GDB, and LLDB uses a client server kind of relationship. So you would copy the debug server binary over to your iOS device. Of course, you would need to give the binary the proper entitlements. And then you would use the debug server to launch the application that you are interested in debugging. And then from your host machine, you would simply connect to the debug server. And an example of that is shown here. So at the top, we have the debug server listening on this port, launching this application. And then from our host machine, we simply connect on that port. One of the issues that you would run into, though, is calculating the offsets or the ASLR slide. And there are a couple approaches that you can use. You can either set a breakpoint on the symbol itself, or you can do it manually. So, well, not manually, but the other approach is once the debug session has started, you can, from your, within that debug session, list the images that are loaded. So you would use uh, image list, minus O minus F, and then you would search for the application. In this case, it's the first one. You would note that offset. And then let's say you wanted to set a breakpoint at this point. What you would do is you would simply add this one, this offset to number one, and then you would set your breakpoint and continue. And then there is JTool. Most might be familiar with OTool. And OTool was the Swiss, the Maco Swiss Armonite, Maco Binary Swiss Armonite. But then there's JTool. And this thing is, it's free. It's an ARM64 disassembler, and it's supported on OS X, iOS, and Linux. It's developed by Jonathan Levin, and it's well supported. And an example of running it on a simple binary is just to disassemble a simple binary, JTool minus D, and in this Example, we are dumping the text section of a simple binary. But JTool also allows you to parse the shared cache. And for those who might not be familiar, the shared cache is a single file with pre-linked system libraries. And it gets loaded once and is then shared by several other processes. And so using JTool, you can list the libraries that are included in the shared cache. And you can also use JTool to disassemble a particular, particular library. And if you are interested in how the shared cache can be abused or was abused for in previous jailbreaks, then I would encourage you to check out Pangu's talk earlier this year at Black Hat. And then there's Proc.exp. Most, if you're coming from a Windows background, then you would be familiar with sysinternals. And sysinternals has Proc.exp. Jonathan Levin has developed Proc EXP for iOS, macOS, and so on. And so it gives you task-related info. You can display threads, map ports, you name it. <coughs> Pretty useful. And then there's GDB, but as we said, GDB is no longer supported on 64-bit architectures. And then a nifty tool is Filemon. And Filemon shows you the interaction between the application and how the application is interacting with the file system using FS events. It's pretty nifty, pretty useful. And then there is Apple CC tools. So you have O tool, which we spoke about earlier on. There is NM tool, which displays the symbol tables, LiPo for, art for you know, listing the architectures embedded in the binary, code sign for code signing, and so on. Truth is, though, that J tool encapsulates a lot of this functionality, and you all you you know, really need is just JTool. All right, so let's now look at under the hood at what's 
So we've just improved our toolkit. Let's now expand our knowledge base, right? So we'll now look what happens under the hood. So we're going to look at the macro binary. What is a Mac task? How can we interact with a Mac task? Briefly touch on ARM assembly, 32 and 64 bit. Look at some objective C and Swift quickly. All right, so each operating system, it's going to have its own executable file format. Windows has PE, Linux has ELF, iOS, OS X has Mako. And that's because, just briefly, at the heart of OS X is the XNU kernel. And the XNU kernel has three main layers. So there is the BSD layer, there is IO kit, and then there is the mock microkernel. So the applications coming from the App Store are stored in, well, prior to iOS 8, VAR mobile applications, and then post iOS 8, the locations split. So the binary is stored one place, and then the data that the the application uses is stored at another location. And then with iOS 9.3, additional changes were made, right? So the macro binary, it's pretty simple. You have a header followed by a number of load commands, and then you have data or code. And the macro header simply specifies whether or not it's a 32-bit, 64-bit binary, the type of file, for example, is it a executable, a dynamic library, a core library, well, a, a core dump, sorry, and so on. And then uh, you have some flags. And one of the flags that we would normally check for during an assessment is the pi flag. And the pi flag is simply to determine whether or not the binary was compiled with ASLR support. And then the macro binary also has a number of instructions, right? And these instructions will determine how the binary gets mapped into memory. Some of these instructions are going to be handled by the kernel, and some are going to be handled by the dynamic linker. Now, the, we refer to these instructions as load commands. And there are several load commands. And as we said, some of these commands will be handled by the kernel, and some will be handled by the dynamic linker. In terms of the kernel, one of the most important commands is the LC segment command, LC segment load command. And that is, and a segment is simply a memory region that has the same read-write executable protections, right? Other important segments handled by the, or load commands handled by the kernel are like LC main. And LC main deals with, is the main entry point into the binary. You have LC encryption info, which deals with encryption, heavily used by applications coming from the App Store. And you also have like LC code signature for, for code signing. Now, what are these segments? Well, you have the page zero, which is for null pointer traps. And that segment has all its permissions revoked. On 64-bit architectures, this is the entire 32-bit space or the first four gigs. You have the text segment, which is for program code. Data, program data, link edit, which is for symbols and it's heavily used by the dynamic linker. And then an important segment is the restrict segment, which prevents us from being able to force load our own dynamic libraries. And we'll see an example of that. And then finally, each segment might have an optional section. So this is just an example of you know, what, a, what segments and sections look like. And you can use the, again, jtool minus L to list the segments. You can use jtool minus V minus L to get more output. And if you're not a command line person, then you can simply use the, the macro view GUI tool. Now, so the, let's say that the, the, once the kernel is done, the kernel hands over processing to the dynamic linker. And the dynamic linker, among other things, is going to resolve symbols and it's going to load in the dynamic libraries. And the libraries that it will copy in or load in are specified in the LC load DYLD, DYLib. So if we go back to where we actually listed the segments, you will see a number of load commands here, lo LC load DYLib with a number of dynamic libraries that should be loaded. The dynamic linker is going to process each of those commands and load those libraries in. 
Additionally, though, the dynamic linker allows us to do things like interposing or method switching. And to do that, all you need to do is add the interpose section to the data segment. As well, you, it allows us to force load our own dynamic libraries. And it does that through the use of the DYLD insert libraries environment variable option. And then just a note on your dynamic libraries, code within that library that has the attribute constructor will be automatically executed once the dynamic library gets loaded. All right, so at this point, the binary is mapped in and it's being executed. On other systems, you would refer to this as a process. In the world of Mark, this is a task. And as with other systems, processes need to communicate with each other. So there needs to be some IPC interprocess communication mechanism. And to do that, each task has a port. And a port is simply a IPC endpoint. The point here is if you are able to own the task port, you own that task. You can, what, what you do with that task is left up to your imagination. And to own that task port, you have a couple of options. You can use the popular Mac trap task for PID, where, as the name suggests, you pass it a process ID and it returns a task port. If you are lucky and the jailbreakers have patched the kernel with task for PID 0, then it gives you access to the kernel task and allows you to dump the kernel. If task for PID is not accessible, then you could use processor set tasks, which will return most task ports in the system. So as we said, to interact with a task port, you get the task. Once you have a handle, then you can use the MapVM APIs to read and write to memory, inject your own shellcode. It's left up to your imagination. And an example is shown here. So you get the, let's see if this works. Ah, so you get the task port, returns a task, and then you pass that into the Mac VM APIs. In this instance, it's Mac VM region. And that just returns information about a region in memory. So it's just a simple example of, of how you would proceed. And then there's dumping memory. You can use proc exp to achieve this. So you can, of course, write your own code and you know, call the appropriate VM APIs. Or you can use proc exp. So you would simply use proc exp, specify the process ID you're interested in, and then use the regions option. And then you would simply pass that region to LLDB, read the region, and write it to a file, which you can then process later on. All right, so just quickly, ARM assembly. ARM32 have a number of registers, R0 to R12, your general purpose registers, R13 stack pointer, R14 is just link register. And the link register is important because it holds the, the return address during a function call. But what's important to note is how are parameters passed when you call a function and where's the return value stored. So R0 to R3, the first four function parameters will be passed to R0, R3, and, other, and the other parameters will be passed on the stack. And then the return value usually gets stored in R0. And of course, functions are invoked through a branch or a branch and exchange a branch and link, where a branch and link simply stores the return address in the link register, branch link and exchange, where you, again, simple branch, link, the return address is stored in the link register and exchange, arm and thumb mode. It is a load store architecture, so of course data must be loaded in the registers before they can be used. And how I choose to remember this is, in a load instruction, you go from right to left. And in a store, you go from left to right, the, 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 the quirks of ARM. And then there's ARM64, a lot more registers. So X0 to X28 your, are now your 64-bit registers. And W0 to W30, your general purpose registers, and so on. And then your arguments, arguments and return values stored in X0 to X7, and so on. I mean, an entire talk could be given on just ARM assembly. Alone. This is the Mount Everest view of ARM assembly. And then there's Objective-C. 
So prior to iOS 8, I think, applications would, have, would be developed in Objective-C. And to call a function, you would use the Objective-C message send. And the Objective-C message send has two, a couple parameters, important parameters. So there is the receiver, which is a pointer to a class the message is intended for. And then there is the selector, which is the method that is going to handle that message. What does this look like from a reverse engineer's perspective? So we have a simple class. And this class has a simple hello world method, takes in a string, prints a string. So from a reverse engineer's perspective, we see x0 being our, the x0 register would have, would be the receiver. x1 would be our selector, which is our hello world method. And then x2 would be the argument, which we pass in. And then we would call that function using message send. A point to note, usually you, you would use class dump to get a list of the classes, their methods, and instance variables. You can do the same with jtool. So you simply specify jtool minus v minus the objective c and you get that information most people well if you're using objective c then of course we all know about method swizzling but what really happens under the hood when we swizzle a method an objective c method struct is going to hold information about the method of a class and that struct has a couple members so it has the name of the method the accepted parameters and more importantly it has a pointer to the method's implementation. Method swizzling is simply manipulating the pointer to the implementation, to the method's implementation. Now, there are frameworks that do this. The most popular one, I guess, would be Cydia Substrate. And you can do, accomplish this with Cydia using the MS hook function for native methods or MS hook function message X for other methods. But under the hood of those methods are just some C functions. And those functions are class replace method, method exchange implementations, and so on. So just an, an example of you know, what's happening under the hood when you call those functions. And an example is shown here of using the MS hook function to swizzle the ptrace and syscall method. Just a quick example. And then there is Swift. Introduced with iOS 8 still uses the traditional message passing for Swift classes that inherit from Objective-C classes. May use direct function calls or vtables, but one thing that you'll note immediately are the mangled names. So what, does, what do these mangled names look like? Well, so we have the Swift binary on the left and the Objective-C binary on the right, and we see some, some very long names here. Now, to interpret those names, this is the approach. So in your source code, I, you would have a simple name in this example, button file check, which just simply checks the, to see if a particular file exists. When that gets disassembled, it, this simple name is translated to this long everlasting name. And just quickly, underscore T indicates that it's a Swift symbol, and then F indicates it's a function. C indicates that it's a function belonging to a class, and so on and so forth. You don't necessarily have to do this manually by yourself. They are, you can use the Swift Demango tool to assist, or you can use a plugin from, or Hopper also has a plugin that will assist you in doing that. All right, so let's wrap up and see how we can use some of what we have discussed to bypass some jailbreak detection simple jailbreak detection routine. Disclaimer, we're going to discuss binary patching next. Now, before I am crucified, yes, there are several other options that you can use to achieve what we are going to discuss. In fact, there are frameworks that allow you to do this. So there is XCon, there is TS Protector, there is Officer. In fact, some of the tools that we discussed before, Cydia Substrate, Frida, can achieve the same thing. But the question is, what happens when you are looking at a binary that you know, doesn't allow you to use one of these tools? You're going to have to get your hands dirty. So the idea with these examples is to introduce you to ARM assembly and to let you know that it's, it's, it's not really as scary as it might sound. And I thought one of the best ways to do that was to use like some simple examples.
So just a note on, on binary patching 101. You can replace a instruction with a NOP, where a NOP is a, is a no operation. You can change a conditional instruction to an uncon unconditional one. So for example, a branch not equal, a branch equal, a branch less than just becomes a branch. And at some point, you're also going to need to update a register so that you, you know, take a particular branch. And to do that, you can use the register write, name of the register, and the value. There might be times when you will have a binary that has the, rest, the restrict segment. And if that's the case, you're going to need to patch it out. All right, so the case study that I'm going to look at, there was an application in the App Store, a very popular one, that would provide information on the security posture of your device. So if you had a jailbreak installed, it would provide information on the type of jailbreak that was installed. It would also provide information on the, on the artifacts left behind by a jailbreak. Once a device is jailbroken, that jailbreaking process will leave behind some artifacts. And jailbreak detection routines simply check for the existence of these artifacts. So it was a, a pretty popular app, pretty useful. Pretty useful. I found it interesting from the standpoint, or from a couple standpoints. So from the standpoint of an attacker, you want to know how the logic is implemented so that you can bypass it. And from somebody like a developer or a, or a defender, you also want to know how the logic is implemented so that maybe you can incorporate it into your own projects or improve upon the logic. So, the first thing that we would do is, of course, let's see how the application interacts with the file system. And you could do that, as we said, using Filemon. Now, the, I'm using Filemon here with the minus L option. And the minus L option allows us to create hard links on temporary files. Throughout an application's execution, the application might create temporary files and then delete them. Using the minus L option allows us to have a copy of those files. And then we can copy them off for further processing. However, in this example, there is really not much, no, nothing interesting happening here, just some image files. We can also look at how the application you know, interacts with the, with the logs. What is it writing to the logs? And we can use iDevice syslog. And this works on both jailbroken and non-jailbroken devices. And here, we see the application printing a number of debug statements to the logs. And this kind of gives us an insight into how the application is implementing the logic. Because what you could do is that you could then search for these strings mentioned here in the binary itself to narrow down where the logic is implemented. And then, of course, you're going to want to obtain the binary. And the most popular way to obtain the binary is to use the dump decrypted dynamic library and its use is facilitated by the dynamic linker, which we discussed earlier on. And the, you would use the DYLD insert libraries environment variable option. Now, as we said, and this is where the restrict segment comes in, if, you are, if the binary has the restrict segment, then you will not be able to use this environment variable to force load your own dynamic library. And <clears throat> we need to, of course, do this because Applications from the App Store are encrypted. However, once they get, once they are executed, they are unencrypted. And so using the dump encrypted dynamic library, we are able to extract the unencrypted contents. And then there are symbols. You want to get the symbols. So you can, of course, use J2-V-S to get the symbols. And not only are you getting the symbols here, but you also get the, the, the libraries to which those symbols belong. And then strings. Are there any interesting strings? You could, usually you would run strings on the binary, but in this case, we are dumping the C string section of the binary. And this, again, is just to highlight the importance of, you know, understanding what segments or what sections are important and so on. And then <clears throat> you might want to extract dynamic libraries. And this is an in interesting one. So, to extract a dynamic library, you, it would go back to PROC EXP, which we discussed earlier on. So you would simply issue PROC EXP, the process ID that you are interested in debugging, and then you would use the regions option. Right? Now, in this example, we are going to be dumping the substrate bootstrap dynamic library. 
So we pass this region into LLDB. So we are, it's a memory read. This is our output file, binary format. This is the range we are interested in, and we dump it to a file. And then, all we need to do is run file on the, the dumped file. We see that it is, in fact, a dynamic library. And then we can disassemble that library and start our reversing. Very nifty. We also want to obtain the classes. And as we touched on earlier, you could use, again, JTool minus V minus the Objective C to dump the classes and their methods. And then once we identify the classes and methods, then we zero in on the logic that we are trying to, to bypass. So one of the logic or one of the tests in this application is to check whether or not the root partition was mounted read-write. On a non-jailbroken device, it's, it's read-only. But once it's jailbroken, then you, it's, it's going to be read-write. And, and so the application here correctly identifies that root partition has read-write access or is mounted with read-write options. Now, what does this look like from a reverse engineer's perspective? So we see the partition, or root partition here. And then this is going to get passed to statfs. And statfs simply returns information on a particular partition. Once this statfs is, so we call the statfs. And then there is a, further on in the disassembly, there is a check. So there is a test branch not zero against register W8. And all we would need to do to bypass this check is to patch that value. So we set our breakpoint, and we examine the contents of register W8. And we, in fact, see that register W8 now, where is my pointer? Is all zeros, right? But the actual check is a test bit branch not zero. And a test bit branch not zero simply in this instance is checking whether the zero bit is a one. And if it is, then a particular branch is taken. So all we need to do to bypass this check is to simply ensure that that bit is in fact set. And so we read the register, W8, and then we simply update the register with a one. We hit continue. We take the branch to 69F4. This message should be printed. And so if we hit continue, the check is bypassed. A very simple, simple example of binary patching. The other example is debugger checks. So applications will usually check to see whether or not they are being debugged. And this application in particular uses a, a couple approaches. So it checks the parent process ID of the calling process, which is this right here, PPID, as well as the ptraced flag, to check if the ptraced flag is set. And so to bypass this check, we would therefore need to bypass the check for PPID, parent process ID, as well as the ptraced check. So let's bypass the, the parent process ID check. So here, we see the call to get PPID, which returns the parent process ID of the calling process. And then we see a comparison of against one with register W0. And if we go back to the ARM assembly, that discussion that we had earlier on, the return value is stored in register W0. So we see a comparison against W1. So just to give you some more info. <coughs> so. So we see a comparison against register W0 and 1. And why 1? If there is no parent process ID that is associated with the calling process, then the call to get parent process ID will return 1. Otherwise, it, re it will return the parent process ID of the calling process. So we set our breakpoint. And we examine what's in register W0. And we see that register W0 has the hex value 72A. And if you convert that to decimal, you will see that the process ID, it's actually the process ID 1834. And that's the process ID of the debug server 
binary that we used to launch the application that we are debugging. So to bypass this check, all we would need to do is to write a one. And having written a one, we would bypass that check. And then there is bypassing ptraced. The check for ptraced is usually implemented through a sys control call. And so in this example, we see the, the parameters being configured before it's passed to sys control. And then we see a comparison a compare branch not zero against x zero. If that condition is satisfied, we take the branch to 5220, right? If not, we go on to print that P trace is enabled. So we need to take this branch, this branch. And to take this branch, we need to therefore ensure that x zero is not zero. So we set our breakpoint again. So at the top, we would see our syscontrol call would then read the register. We see that it is zero, but we need this to be a not zero to take the branch. We simply update it to a one. We hit continue, and we have bypassed both checks. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And then finally, there's the check for fork. And you usually see a check for fork when you are testing the integrity of the sandbox. In a properly functioning sandbox, the call to fork should fail on a jailbroken device, however. So, so this is just a, a common check. And what does this check look like? So we see the call, we see the call to fork here. And then we see a comparison against negative one. And so all we, we would need to do, and the, the comparison against negative one indicates that, well, if it's a negative one, then of course it indicates that the call to fork failed. Because if the call to fork was successful, then it should return a valid process ID. And so all we need to do is set our breakpoint. Again, read register W19, and we would update the register W19 with the appropriate value to take the branch that we are interested in. And so in wrapping, in, in, in wrapping up, the, the common bugs as we know it are being closed. And we therefore will need a new approach and a break from the norm when we are talking about in-depth assessment. Additionally, knowledge of iOS or the iOS architecture will not only improve your assessments, but it will also you know, provide the launching pad for further research. The bug bounties for iOS these days are, are pretty high. And uh, disassemblers are your friends. ARM assembly isn't that bad. You just need to you know, get used to it. Just pop a, simply, a, a very simple binary open. So just write a very simple binary, pop it into a disassembler, um, and just work your way from there. And then I would encourage you to add the reversing, the reverse engineering skill set to your arsenal. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. And that's it. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.